but I think I'm finally at the point where I can comfortably admit to myself and to you guys that I'm going to be leaving medicine for good. I left medicine. Recently decided to quit my degree. It's all about why I quit a career in medicine. I quit my job as a junior doctor in the NHS. And I'm now leaving medicine. In leaving clinical medicine. To leave my career as a doctor after 12 years of practice. I have quit my job as an anesthesiologist. So one of the things I find really interesting when I start to watch these kind of videos of doctors quitting their jobs is that, first of all, there seem to be a lot of doctors quitting their jobs. But the other thing I find actually more interesting than that is that uh, if you watch the videos, you kind of get the feeling that the advice is something along the lines of you have to figure out what you want out of life, what is your dream, what is your passion, and then you have to have the courage to pursue whatever that is, right? Um, but if you were a friend of mine and you were to actually come up to me and say, okay, should I quit my job? There are some things I like, there are some things I don't like about my job, but I'm seriously considering leaving medicine and pursuing some other thing that I, I consider is my passion. Should I actually do that? Then my advice would be a little bit different because although, because although pursuing a dream was certainly part of my decision, I think that if you truly want to be happy and you truly want to be successful in whatever in whatever path you chose, you have to, you kind of have to ask yourself the opposite question. You kind of need to have the opposite approach because I think that makes a lot more sense. But to understand why it makes more sense, we first have to understand a key principle about human condition. And to do that, I want to show you this symbol right here, which as you probably know is the famous Eastern philosophy symbol of yin and yang. So, for those who don't know, this symbol basically represents the opposite but interconnected forces of life, right? You have order and chaos, day and night, good and bad, pizza and vegetables, those kind of stuff. And this symbol is portrayed like this to convey the message that life is sort of a package deal, that you can't have one thing without the other, that you can have a positive without an associated negative. And this cartoon is kind of the perfect example of what I'm talking about. So on the left side, you have a guy who basically has no money and he's suffering precisely because of that, because now he's thinking, OK, do my friends judge me for being cheap? Am I a moocher? How do I get money? Do people see me as a victim? Those kind of thoughts are bothering him. But on the right side, you have a guy who is the complete opposite, who has tons of money, but is also suffering precisely because of that, because now he's thinking, OK, do my friends just like me because I'm rich? Are people using me? How do I keep my money safe? Do people see me as entitled? So this is a great example of the phrase that everyone has money problems. It's just that people have different kind of money problems. And yes, I know that this is kind of a silly example, but this silly example tells you something quite deep about human condition. And once you start noticing it, you start seeing it everywhere. For instance, the person who is alone suffers because he's alone, while the person who's in a relationship, the complete opposite, suffers because of the emotional psychodrama that being in a relationship has. The person who is fat suffers because of his body. The person who is very skinny also suffers because of his body, while the person who is in shape suffers because of the things they have to do to stay in shape. The person who is unemployed suffers because of the unemployment, while the person who has a job suffers because of the job. And as it turns out, even the people who have no problems, who eliminate all the main problems of their life, they also suffer because apparently living a life without problems makes you feel worthless, nihilistic and depressed and makes you start stressing over the most absurd details in life. But the reason I think this is so important is because contrary to what images like these would tell you, I think that negatives in our lives tend to represent more than 50% of our time and attention. I mean, think about it. Do you spend half of your time having breakthroughs, getting paychecks, receiving awards and doing everything perfectly? Or do you spend most of your time solving problems and going through stuff? You spend 50% of your time in absolute happiness and bliss? Congrats, man. But that's not the life of most people. And in fact, I would argue that even if your life is split 50-50 between positives and negatives, negatives would still matter more to you in the end. And there's actually research behind this claim. For instance, you've probably heard that in average, people feel a greater pain when losing a hundred bucks than they feel joy by finding that exact same amount. This is not a rational response because in the end is the same amount. But this is how it is because psychologically speaking, we are wired to pay more attention to negatives than to positives. So it is because of these reasons that I think that what's your dream and what do you want out of life are the wrong kind of questions. Because think about it, when you ask yourself these sort of questions, what comes to mind? If you're like most people, you think about a loving partner, a fulfilling job, a great salary, a big house, good health, being in shape, 
those are the things that kind of come to mind. And what do those things have in common? They're all positive. And that's precisely the problem, that these responses are only considering half of the picture. And they're considering the part of the picture that matters least. So because of this, I think that the questions we really should be answering are not, what's my dream and what do I want out of life? But instead, what kind of pain do I prefer to endure? What kind of problems do I prefer to have in my day to day? What kind of negatives do I tend to thrive off? Thinking about these kind of questions has a twofold effect. First, it makes you consider and accept the negatives of the path you're about to embark. And this is vital because research has shown that when people make life-changing decisions, they tend to downplay the negatives. Sometimes they don't even think about them. And this is a problem because when you frame the question in a way that makes you think only about the positives, you unconsciously set up an expectation for your mind that everything should be positive, that your dream is for everything to be positive, that that's your dream. And that's a huge problem. One of my favorite authors, Mo Gadad, explains it like this. Imagine you were walking on the street and out of the blue, someone gifted you a brand new car. You'd be thrilled, right? Even if it has a few imperfections, even if you find some scratches on the back, you'd feel very happy because the expectation walking on the street is not to receive anything, let alone a car. So even a car with scratches and imperfections makes you happy. But if you spend a year saving up money and looking for the perfect car, and then after buying the supposedly perfect car, you realize that there's a couple of scratches in the back and a couple of imperfections, you instantly feel sad because the expectation was for it to be perfect. So thinking in these terms makes you create a more realistic expectation, makes you consider and accept the negatives of the path you're about to embark. And that by itself is a huge step forward. But additionally, this approach is really useful because it tells you that, well, you can't really avoid problems, but to a certain extent, you can choose which type of problems you have. And this is basically what I thought when I decided to quit medicine. I thought, okay, I can't have a stress-free life. I understand that. But do I prefer to stress over medical board exams, certification courses, and clinic duties as a doctor? or over the process of crafting my own projects and my own courses as a creator. I thought, all right, I understand that sometimes I'll have to work on stuff I don't really feel like doing, but do I prefer that to be editing a course on my computer in my house or maybe working on a sponsorship video, or do I prefer that to be working on a research project with an attending? I thought, all right, sometimes I'll have shitty days, okay, but do I prefer to have them in my house, throwing out a complicated project, rewriting a script, or maybe reshooting this very same scene like seven times, or do I prefer to have them in the hospital, sorting out a difficult patient, calling the lab, running around the hospital? Do I prefer the lack of freedom and autonomy of being a doctor, or do I prefer the lack of safety and certainty of being a creator? So what I'm trying to say is that yes, my decision to leave medicine was partly done in the name of potential upsides of positives, but it was also made in the name of negatives, in the name of choosing which kind of downsides align more with the person I am, with the things I naturally prefer, with the things I naturally enjoy, with things I naturally thrive off, and with the person I wanna eventually become. There's a paragraph by Mark Manson in the book The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck that summarizes perfectly my feelings on the matter. It says the following. Imagine that somebody puts a gun to your head and tells you to have to run 26.2 miles in under 5 hours, or else he'll kill you and your entire family. That would suck. Now imagine that you bought nice shoes and running gear, trained religiously for months, and completed your first marathon with all of your closest family and friends, cheering you on at the finish line. That could potentially be one of the proudest moments of your life. Exact same 26.2 miles, exact same person running them, exact same pain coursing through your exact same legs. But when you chose it freely and prepared for it, it was a glorious and important milestone in your life. When it was forced upon you against your will, it was one of the most terrifying and painful experiences of your life. Often, the only difference between a problem being painful or being powerful is a sense that we chose it and that we're responsible for it. So that's what I think we should all aim for, the active choosing, not of our blessings, but of our struggles. If you want to read more about this topic, this is a great book to do so. Another one you can read is So Good They Can Ignore You by Cal Newport. They're different kind of books, but they both touch upon this topic and give amazing advice to help you put your life together and reach your goals. Now, speaking about reaching your goals, one of the things you will have to do if you want to pursue a different career in something is learning the fundamentals of that career. But I get it, most of the time this is quite boring, right? Especially when the learning material looks something like this. 
But worry not, because there's a place that allows you to learn everything about the fundamentals of several STEM topics in the most fun and interactive way possible. That place is, of course, brilliant. And I'm very happy to say that they're sponsoring this video and offering some amazing discounts to my subscribers. So the reason I love Brilliant is because they make learning fun. And the best way to show you that is through a real example. So let's say I want to learn more about computer science. And let's say I want to learn specifically about binary search. So instead of just Googling binary search PDF and reading away a monster like this paper, which was the first recommendation, Brilliant presents me with a module that right off the bat starts with a game. They explain the game, the rules, and then they start challenging me with questions like this one right here. And so as you start solving these questions here and there, you start to realize exactly what is binary search, how it works, and even the mathematical principles behind it. But here's the amazing part. They don't have to come here and tell you, okay, this is binary search, it's defined like this, and this is how it's done, and this is the formula. No, no, no. You kind of discover it for yourself as you play along. And this is done so smoothly that it honestly never feels like you're studying. It feels like play. Using this learning method, Brilliant helps you to learn anything about science, math, and computer science. And when I say anything, I kind of literally mean anything. I mean, as of right now, they have thousands of lessons available and they keep adding new ones every single month. And so if you like what you hear, make sure to start learning better by using my link at brilliant.org slash Santiago AQ. And hurry, because the first 200 subscribers that use that link will get a 20% of discount in the annual premium subscription. Thanks a lot, Brilliant, for sponsoring this video. To you for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one.